Thanks very much for having me here today. Uh, really fantastic to be here because this is a terrific opportunity for us to really transform our city with a very exciting project. It's also an opportunity for us as financiers to think differently. And given the sheer volume and the length of duration of the project, it does call for some out there thinking. Now, Commonwealth Bank is very well positioned to be providing information on uh, the financing options for infrastructure projects. We have greater than 100 year history partnering with government and corporates. Uh, we are one of the largest fund managers in Australia with more than 250 billion funds under administration. We participate in almost all sources of financing and partner with companies who do anything that we don't. We're also the largest employer in New South Wales and our company and our staff are big users of the precinct. But the, the people from Urban Growth actually asked me to provide some innovative ideas and provocative ideas that would stimulate thinking amongst the group. So I'm not really gonna be up here talking about any official views of the Commonwealth Bank. I'm gonna throw out a lot of uh, interesting and out there ideas as we go along. And if anyone wants to know the official ComBank position, you can come and talk to me afterwards. So there are a few subjects I'm gonna cover in the talk today. Uh, and they're listed on the screen there talking about getting the project sizing right, making sure we have the appropriate risk allocation, structuring some innovative solutions for financing, and then how we establish a simpler procurement process. So I'll start with getting the project sizing right. This is important for us to consider, both in terms of attracting the right developers and attracting the right financiers. And we have to get both of those right in order to have a viable project or set of projects. Now, it's a little bit like the Goldilocks story. If the development projects are too small, you won't attract the tier one developers. But if they're too large, they may not want to bet the house on one development. And you have to take into account the supply of labor and how that's gonna work over du the duration of the project because all of the developers are constrained by the number of quality tradies that they can attract with the right skills and sustain that over a period for a long amount of time. Now, when it comes to investor considerations, you also have to think about the precedent that's been set. The historic sweet spot for New South Wales PPPs was 300 to 500 million. But let's look at what developments are going on at the moment. We have the Sydney Convention Center, $1 billion. The Royal North Shore redevelopment, $1.1 billion. We have the Northwest Rail PPP, $3 billion. Barangaroo, $4.3 billion. West Connects, $10 billion. If you take all of that together, you have to understand the amount of capacity that has already been taken up of investors willing to invest in projects. And those are just the ones that are already on the cards. As everybody knows, there's more in the pipeline, there's more privatizations to come. So our view is that you have to get the size right and make bite-sized parcels. So it is back to the Goldilocks stories. You need to be able to feed baby bear and papa bear and mama bear. You need small parcels, 50 to 100 million, to attract the smaller developers and investors. You need very large size parcels, two to seven billion, to attract the tier one uh, uh, developers, as well as the overseas developers who will need to come and bring in some capacity into this market. And then you need the medium sized parcels for the tier two developers who will have a big role to play in, in urban renewal. So it is about getting the size just right. Now let's talk about appropriate risk allocation. And to do that, I want, before I jump into the topic, I thought it might be interesting to think about the role of government and the role of government in assuming risks and taking risks. So if we go back many years, 100 years ago, and start having a look at what some individuals might have said about the role of government, uh, why don't we start I don't know, let's start with someone like Adam Smith. He would have said that government plays three distinct roles, 
providing national defence, uh, providing a judicial system, and then also the provision of certain public goods for the community. If we look at John Maynard Keynes, he would have said that the government should help out the economy and has a role to play in public spending. And I think it's good to bear in mind the role of the government as we start thinking through risk allocation. But we need to also start with the right mindset because often the approach is for government to try and minimize risk. And that is unlikely to result in the very best outcome and value for money. So I would encourage people to think about the idea of risk optimization across a diverse range of stakeholders. And if we go for risk op optimization, then the classic definition is that you want those participants who are best placed to manage and control the outcomes to be accountable for assessing and pricing the risks associated with those outcomes. And if you can achieve that philosophical balance, then you will be apportioning risk into the right places. Now, before we dive into which risks who can take, I think it is important to take a, a step back and really think about this from a more corporate perspective. There are some non-negotiables that the corporate sector just will not be able to take on as risks. And I've tried to list those on the screen behind me. But things like native title risk, cultural heritage risk, unknown pre-existing contamination risk, and planning risk cannot be taken on by the corporate sector. And so there is clearly a role for governments to play in taking on those risks. There is also a role for government to play in helping the private sector understand and assess all the risks that they do want the, corp the corporate sector to take on. And so let's have a look at what some of those may be. So starting with construction risk. Now we all know that the private sector is willing to take on construction risk, risk and has a good track record of doing so. So what can be done in order to make sure that the corporate sector most appropriately assesses and, takes and prices that risk? Well, it starts with a fantastic master plan. A plan that really sets out all the objectives and then phases all the development in a sensible and logical way that also matches the developer's ability to staff and manage that project over its life cycle. So that is construction risk. Let's look at demand risk when it comes to greenfield traffic. This is another risk that the private sector has shown that it's willing to take on. And you can argue that it's even gone too far. And there have been a number of very high profile issues when it comes to greenfield traffic risk in both New South Wales and Queensland. But there are some good examples where we've gone back to sensible structures to try and address these risks. And a very good example is in Chile, who've taken the lead on some of these. And what they introduced was a target as well as a minimum. And the, go the government underwrote underperformance to the minimum. It also matched the concession period to the target and then introduced a cap and a collar so that while it was underwriting underperformance to the risk, it enabled the private sector to participate in the upside, but only to a point. So a good structure. If we want to look closer to home, let's have a look at the West Connect structure. What's happening there is that the government is funding the first stage of this project from a combination of Commonwealth grants, extending the concession on existing assets, and getting an upfront payment from the owners. What they're going to do is progressively sell down their stake as the project progresses and is de-risked, and then recycle the capital back into subsequent stages of the project. They've also indicated that they intend to maintain a minimum of 20% in the project, which is good. Now, if we took this concept and applied it to the bays, we could even think about taking that further for example, we could add to the government equity stake a performance element, such as a surety bond, which would further de-risk this stage. Now, there's also another demand risk, which is about real estate and getting the right mix 
between what the market requires and what consumers want and what's good and in the best public interest and the right mix of housing styles and retail opportunities. Now again, the best plan here is a, is a good master plan that lays everything out. And it is all about the phasing because you don't want to be in the position where you have an empty shopping centre. So of course the universities, the roads, the schools need to come before the shopping centres. Uh, and, and so that phasing and uh, thinking through all the subsequent stages it might sound obvious, and a lot of people are nodding in the audience, but you'd be amazed at the number of projects that build the shopping centers first. Now, there also needs to be underwriting of demand through long-term services contracts or long-term tenancies. And where the government can help here is in social infrastructure, things like schools and hospitals, and then other creative ideas. I don't know, maybe we could move the New South Wales Parliament from Macquarie Street to the New Bays Precinct? No, not funny. So in summary, if we want to talk about how to help the private sector take on the risks that are most rightly allocated to them, it really comes down to three big things. Who wants to say what they are? I've got to keep you involved because of the fans and everything, it's really loud in here. So number one, I've said it at least five times, a master plan, master plan. Number two, really good phasing and staging in the project. And number three, a philosophy that seeks to allocate risks to those who are most in the position to control, manage, assess and price those risks. Let's move on to structuring the best solutions, the third topic that I wanted to cover. Now, we all know what the current suite of financing options is that's available. You know, the bank debt market is, has shown to be very supportive and has a good track record in infrastructure in Australia. Equities, we have one of the top, the ASX is one of the top 10 exchanges, raised over 64 billion in the last 12 months. Super funds, we have the fourth largest supermarket in the world. We have our own future fund that has more than 100 billion uh, available. Government can hold assets, etc. And we've always been a good jurisdiction for attracting international investment. So lots of options available that are traditional that we know about that I'm not going to spend any time on. But we should think about what some of the dynamics are that we need to be mindful of when counting on these sources moving forward. So the first is that banks are not incentivized to hold risks on property developers for more than five or six years. Or where they do have the appetite to do so, it could be very expensive given the capital impost. And that appetite is going to be further affected as the implementation of Bol 3 washes through the economy. Also, there are bandwidth limitations on the large contractors in our market. And so international contractors are going to have to enter for us to do the amount of development simultaneously that seems to be on the cards. And the traditional Australian financiers are not yet comfortable with those contractors, and so it will take time for them to be able to borrow in the quantities we might be thinking. The local debt capital markets are very short term and we have a habit of corporates going offshore for tenor. There is no real independent corporate bond market that exists independently of the bank debt market. And then there's a very interesting dynamic in our superannuation industry. Unlike Canada, where the Canadian pension funds are mostly defined benefit schemes, so they can afford to take very long term infrastructure investments and count on their flows and have lots of predictability as to their funds flows. The introduction of choice in super funds and the rising prevalence of self-managed super funds means that the Australian superannuation industry cannot easily predict what their flows are. And they're under a lot of pressure to demonstrate short-term performance in order to retain their customers who have choice and attract new customers to them. So their ability to take very long-term bets is, is also being questioned by this drive for short-term performance. And then finally, 
international is part of the solution, but we can't think that it's 100% of the solution because there's a level of foreign investment that may not be politically palatable. So given that there are all these challenges, we thought it'd be good to think about some different and out there models of financing. So here goes the part that's meant to make you really think hard and come up with lots of other, even better ideas. Let's start with philanthropy. So there are high net worth individual, individuals who don't necessarily need a return on their investment and who are willing to invest for the greater good. An example is the Australian Chamber Orchestra, which has a fund for investing in rare string instruments. Now this fund does have a return, but that is not the primary motivator for the investors in that fund. Now there's no reason why this kind of a model could not be used for sculptures, music halls, universities, other, other items that you'd like to put into the precinct. And it could be structured so that generational uh, or intergenerational naming rights are provided and funded directly by an individual or via a charitable foundation on behalf of an individual, a family, or a company. Another idea, an infrastructure staple. So imagine if the government was providing a common financing package to all bidders stapled to their request for procuring the asset. Bank debt could write an acquisition facility for the delivery of the asset and then this could be replaced by an operating lease. The residual value component would be off balance sheet for government, and the residual value could be up to 50 to 60% of the asset, depending on the asset type. The government is only committed to the rental, but maintains control. And although this kind of structure might seem new and hasn't been achieved in Australia, we are starting to see uh, small projects like this in other parts of the world, such as Eversholt Rail in the UK. Okay, what about a free economic zone in the Bayes Precinct? Now, we could have zones in the Bayes Precinct for industries that are the growth engine of tomorrow. For example, Abbott's five target industries that uh, were announced. Now, all the banks and financiers lend to those sectors anyway, so imagine the amplification that could be achieved if we had a zone that was targeted in that way. Now, clearly, this is not without its issues, particularly political issues. It was discussed but rejected at Barangaroo because of argy-bargy between New South Wales and Victoria. But surely these issues can be solved over time. For example, we could allocate one growth center to each of five states, or we could assess on a deal-by-deal -deal basis with reference to the pub some published principles. Now, if we push the envelope even further under this uh, heading of a free economic zone, uh, what about having the bays be a designated infrastructure project that attracts tax-preferred or tax-exempt status, or even bringing back the retail infrastructure bonds? Let's talk about a development bank. So this would be a dedicated vehicle with investment by public and private sectors, funded by real assets and uncalled capital. It could be a conduit to bring international investors in and allow them to support their developers as they enter the Australian market. It's a great way of integrating Australia with the region. I think many of you will know that an Asian development bank has been spoken about. It's a particularly European concept, but there's versions of it in the US as well. And you could use something like a New South Wales Future Fund as the vehicle for the government's equity interest. Now, this has been raised again in the uh, potential electri electricity privatization arena. And it would actually be quite a good fit for the defined benefit liabilities that are owed to the public sector employees. You could even bring in retail through retail or social bonds or some sort of a project hybrid. Now, all those four ideas I've spoken about so far and all of the funding we, uh, financing methods we went through really revolve around Western structures of financing. But perhaps we need to be more open as an economy 
and we need to look at all ways of raising capital, even outside our typical markets. So I'll give a couple of examples, one being Sharia bonds. Now we know that there are countries and investor bases who, uh, where interest-bearing bonds are not permissible. So here we could structure some sort of a profit share post-construction phase. And then we'd be able to target this at markets that include Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Middle East. Now, no one has cracked this at scale yet in Australia. Uh, the UK government is the first Western government that uh, sold a Sharia bond. They did so in June of this year. It was for 200 million British pounds, and it was 10 times oversubscribed. Another example of this is trying to structure for pools of capital and market nuances. So an example would be Japan. Currently, there are structural limitations to directly accessing retail investors over there, and that's largely a product of the um, banking system hierarchy. But we know that there are investors who are long on deposits and keen to find assets to match. So by working with the Japanese government and regulators, we could look at innovative ways of accessing that investor base. So I'm not saying that any of these are easy or without their challenges and pros and cons, but I think hopefully it gives you an idea and, and gives you some stimulation for thinking through different ways in which the financing challenge could be addressed in the Bayes precinct. Now my last topic that I wanted to talk about was just establishing a simpler procurement process. And before I dive into what I think could be done differently, I think we should acknowledge that there are some things that are working really well. So lots of market soundings, frequent interactions with consortia, all improve people's understanding and ability to assess and price risk. That's good. Allowing for some innovation. An example is the Sydney Convention Center, which didn't have their DA approved. Allowing for innovation in design from the consortia. So that's a good step. Not having bank exclusivity, well, we would certainly endorse that. And some added bid, bid flexibility, where you have the ability to enter non-conforming bids in addition to your conforming bid. All very positive steps in improving the bid process. But we think that there are some things that could be done differently. And the, the one reason we think that is because the typical PPP bid in Australia costs double that of Canada. And um, there's, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that our bids are generally more complex because they focus on value for money for the government, sometimes at the exclusion of other stakeholders. And secondly, there's a requirement to have a very high level of certainty on all the commercial terms before a preferred bidder is uh, appointed. And that causes a lot of time uh, money and legal fees to be incurred by multiple players much earlier in the process than may actually be needed. So there are some options for thinking differently about the bidding process. We could create a structure like the Chicago Infrastructure Trust, which would build up institutional expertise in the public sector. We could use standardized contracts. We actually have a national PPP framework. Might be time to actually use that. And then there's a question about whether we should redefine the scope of probity. Now, clearly, probity is a good thing, but probity is not always conducive to inviting innovation. And so a model I think we can think about is, is one that is prevalent in defense. In defense, it's widely recognized that you need to have, the, the government needs the ability for people to approach them with cutting edge leading defense technology. So they designate certain, certain suppliers as strategic who are able to bring ideas to the government, not just respond to a very structured tender process. It might be time to think about whether there are other elements of government activity where innovation is also valuable, where there can be a change in approach like the defense model, where there are strategic suppliers who are able to innovate and bring unsolicited ideas to the government. So those would be, hopefully, two interesting ideas about improving the process. Now, I think I actually provided more questions than I did answers, which is what I was intending to do. And I don't think that that is actually a bad thing. 
because it is through a rich dialogue and debate that the best answers come to light over a period of time. And as long as you have a really great vision in the beginning and you get a whole bunch of people working towards that vision, then I'm confident that the answers will emerge. And to give you confidence in this concept, I'm actually going to share with you a clip. It's a clip from 1987 that was produced by Apple for its internal employees. It's a clip that lays out what they thought the future of computing would be 20 years from when they designed this video. And I think you will be astounded, and I'll point out as we go through the clip, all the wonderful things that Apple has delivered to us in the last 10 years are in this clip from 1987. Now, just to put it in context, because so, it's easy to watch this clip and think, yeah, that's obvious. 1987 was the Macintosh 2, which was only the second generation after the first graphical user interface. Most computers were still running DOS. For those old enough in the room, that's the one with the black screen and the green text, ASCII. The first mobile phone was shown in Australia. It was an absolute brick. It cost $5,000. There was one of them in the country. The internet had not been invented. Yahoo, who was the who's who of the internet before Google, was only founded in 1994. So this is 1987. Take a look. It is 1987, so the quality is not brilliant, but I think you'll get the gist. So there's what the computer looked like back then. Research team in Guatemala just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on Me his term too. paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm-hmm, fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm Integrated sorry, she's not phone available and right computer. Now. I left a message that you had called. OK. Let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Flemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He's searching the internet. He published in the Journal of Earth Science of July 20 of 2006. Yes, that's it. He was challenging Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being released to the atmosphere through deforestation. I'd like to recheck his figures. Here's the rate of deforestation he predicted. Mm -hmm. Okay, the what charts happened? are a bit better than what they thought. Hmm. He was really off. Give me the university research network. Show only universities with geography nodes. Touch screen. Show Brazil. Copy the last 30 years at this location at one month intervals. It's a USB, only it looks Excuse like a credit me. card. Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great. Put her through. Hi, Mike. What's up? Jill, thanks for getting Face back time. to me. Well, I guess that new grant of yours hasn't dampened your literary abilities. Rumor has it that you've just put out the definitive article on deforestation. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Is this one of your typical last-minute panics for lecture material? No, 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 no. That's not until, um... 4.15. Well, it's about the effects that reducing the size of the Amazon rainforest can have outside of Brazil. I was wondering, um, it's not really necessary, but, uh... Mm, yes? Uh, it would be great if you were available to make a few comments. Nothing formal. After my talk, you would come up on the big screen, discuss your article, and then answer some questions from the class. And bail you out again? Well, I think I could squeeze that in. You know, I have a simulation that shows the spread of the Sahara over the last 20 years. Here, let me show you. Desktop sharing through WebEx or one of those services? Nice. Very nice. I've got some maps of the Amazon area during the same time. Let's put these together. Now, it's still not that good or easy to do this kind of research and combining data sets, so there's still more they can come out with. Great. I'd like to have a copy of that for myself. Hmm. What happens if we bring down the logging rate to 100,000 acres per year? Hmm. Interesting. I can definitely use this. Thanks for your time, Jill. I really appreciate it. No problem. But next time I'm in Berkeley, you're buying the dinner. Dinner, right. See ya, 4.15. Bye-bye. While you were busy, your mother called again to remind you to pick up the birthday cake. Mm, fine, fine, fine. Um, print this article before I go. Now printing. So I'm not going to finish the video. It's only got a few seconds to play. But I think you get the idea that they had a very bold vision back in 1987. And even though they didn't have all the answers and the technology to implement it at the time, 25 years later, we are the beneficiary of many of the ideas that were already thought of and contemplated back then. And so I really want to applaud uh, Urban Growth for having a big vision, for engaging so many people in coming up with the solutions. And I'm confident that if we all put our heads together, we will do some amazing things for the precinct. So thanks for your attention, and I hope you'll enjoy the afternoon tea break.